for pod communities in six major metropolitan cities. In short, Desiree studies plants, animals, insects, and people. So this talk is sure to have a little something for everyone's biological interests. Uh, thanks for being here, Desiree, you can take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Is that working? Thumbs up? I'm gonna assume it's good. Uh, so thank you so much for that introduction. It uh, makes me feel like there's a lot going on. Um, and so I'm only gonna talk to you today about a little bit of uh, my research program, but um, if you go to my website, you can find out more about uh, the wide variety of different topics uh, that I focus on. And please feel free to reach out to me anytime if you'd like to uh, connect or collaborate. Um, and I also just want to say uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you guys uh, remotely as well. Um, this is uh, always a great opportunity for an early career person, and I appreciate uh, that flexibility. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm excited to share with you a little bit about what uh, these uh, little birds and insects have taught me about how we can harness uh, plant management to support biodiversity conservation in a uh, changing planet. And also they've taught me a lot about how we as uh, individuals and as uh, land managers can participate in conservation action at home as well. So hopefully this goes forward. Okay, um, so without further ado, uh, so in my research program, I predominantly study biodiversity in human dominated landscapes. And if you think about that, uh, it's basically everywhere because we have dramatically and very rapidly transformed the world to support our human needs and values. Um, and with that comes really cascading impacts on habitat quality for wildlife. And as ecologists, we are probably uh, well aware of the headlines that we see uh, almost daily now uh, about uh, undergoing a major sixth extinction of biodiversity. Uh, there were some uh, recent very high profile uh, studies looking at major declines of all kinds of insect taxa across the globe. And even with birds, there was a study in 2019 showing that uh, even without thinking about species, if we just think about abundance and biomass of birds, that we've lost almost 3 billion birds in just the last 50 years or so, which is really incredibly alarming. Uh, but there's one aspect aspect of our, um, our new extinction that is overlooked uh, quite a bit when we focus on species extinction, and that's the extinction of ecological interactions. And um, I really like this quote from Dan Jansen. He spoke about this back in the 70s. This is not a new idea. And he said that there's a much more insidious kind of extinction. It's the extinction of ecological interactions. And when we lose those ecological interactions, we lose ecosystem function, we lose services provided to us, we lose ecosystem resilience, and we accelerate species loss as well. And so we're losing interactions between plants and animals, interactions between um, consumers and other consumers. Uh, but the other the other kind of interaction that we're losing is interactions between people and nature too. And I don't wanna just discount that interaction because arguably it's the most important interaction of all. And so that's really where my research program fits in is trying to understand how these ecological interactions are affected by global change. And so I've had work uh, looking at uh, how organisms are affected by their novel conditions like anthropogenic noise and artificial light. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today is about uh, trophic interactions between organisms and how our changes in plant communities can impact those relationships. And then I also, uh, in some other aspects of my work, uh, really try to dig in a little deeper in how people are connecting with nature. Uh, but I can only do this work through 
uh, the immense expertise and collaboration with lots of social scientists who are really the experts in that area. But I'm happy as a biodiversity ecologist to uh, help make sense of these relationships as well. Um, and so in order to get at these questions, I really use uh, a lot of different approaches. And so uh, some of the work that I'm going to talk about today is really from the individual perspective in, in terms of diet, uh, nutrition, behavior, habitat selection, um, uh, as well as uh, some population work in demographic monitoring as well. Uh, but I also have various aspects of my research that focus on more community level relationships, um, such as the macroecological patterns across the United States. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that work, uh, which is ongoing today. Um, but again, please reach out uh, if you're interested in any of these topics. Um, and like Anna said, I'm, I'm starting a new position and moving my research program to uh, Vermont Center for Eco Studies. And we're going to have lots of new projects starting up soon. So uh, keep an eye out. So for a lot of my work, I'm where my role really is, is trying to find where these conservation solutions can happen in human dominated land uses. Um, and I would argue that we can't really have effective conservation unless we include privately managed land. And that's because uh, in the continental United States, there's some estimates that more than 60% of that is considered privately owned. And that comes up in various kinds of land uses like uh, family forests, which constitute 15% of the United States. Uh, if we think about agriculture, and especially I'm interested in agroforestry, there's 1 billion hectares of agroforestry worldwide uh, that is almost entirely planted uh, through the needs and values of those, uh, of those parcel owners. And then one of the land uses that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is residential parcels, which I want to emphasize is not the same thing as urban systems. So if we look at urban systems, that is about 3% of the United States. But if we look at the land uses that are considered uh, used primarily for residential development, that shoots up the percentage of land area that's occupied up to 20% and growing with some estimates in the next century that this percentage will go up to 25 or 30% of the United States. Um, so with all of this land area comes uh, tremendous potential for biodiversity conservation, for climate adaptation, and uh, social and environmental justice benefits as well, if we start to think about how we can create ecologically functional habitat in these novel systems. Uh, but in order to get there, we first have to study them. That's really important. Uh, but then we also have to provide information and resources that people can use in their decision making, while also making sure that we still retain uh, room for including human needs and values as well. Uh, so going back to these in, uh, to these biodiversity declines, one of the ones that's received a lot of attention is our insect decline that we're seeing. And David Wagner is an entomologist who published uh, a very depressing paper <laughs> in 2020 where he talks about all the mechanisms of insect decline. And he calls it... Uh, a, a, a very pessimistic death by a thousand cuts, which is basically uh, to insinuate that it's not just one mechanism that's contributing to decline. There's lots of different factors that are um, additively uh, contributing to the declines in species and abundance that we see. Um, but I've got to say that I'm actually a conservation optimist. Uh, I love David Wagner, but I will look at this list of these thousand cuts that are potentially influencing insects and uh, actually seeing a lot of commonalities between some of these mechanisms. So if we think about mechanisms like species interaction disruption, fire, climate change, non-native species, agriculture, urbanization, what we can uh, see is that a lot of these are really affected by plant communities and our relationships with those plant communities. And that I would argue that by rethinking our relationship with plants, we can actually be really effective at biodiver biodiversity conservation by tackling multiple one, uh, multiple 
of these mechanisms simultaneously. And so why this is really important on private land is because one of the primary ways that people personally manage their properties is through the, the plants that they cultivate. Uh, from the developers choosing to cut some species down and plant other ones, uh, the designer gardens that we create, how many different times that we decide to mow. Each one of those uh, seemingly small decisions has had the additive effect of completely transforming the composition of plant communities that have survived to occupy the present day. Uh, and I'm, I'm calling in here from New England in Massachusetts, and this is a really great place uh, to think about some of these questions uh, because we have the novel New England forest. In fact, in New England, we are more than 75% of our land area is forested. So from the top down, it actually seems like we're doing really great in terms of uh, protecting nature and uh, promoting biodiversity. But when we look at the actual uh, forests that are, that are within New England, we see a lot of heterogeneity and we see a forest that's completely different from what it was historically. So we see young fragmented stands, reduced diversity, uh, reduced dominance of our uh, foundation and keystone species and increased presence of native and non-native non and invasive species. Um, and so even though we see a lot of these more fine scale changes in uh, forest and green space plant composition, we know really surprisingly little about how these effects cascade to affect the rest of the food webs and especially in these human dominated systems. Which, which brings me to the main question that I'm talking to you about today, which is to tackle the question of whether we can actually use plant animal interactions as a way to inform uh, habitat management for multi-trophic biodiversity. One of the reasons that plant communities can really affect the insects that can use these different habitats is because uh, more than 90% of our plant eating insects are specialists to some degree. And what that means is that at, over evolutionary time, these plant-eating herbivores have adapted to use very particular plants that they've overcome those nasty defensive chemical compounds that are found in the leaf, but they also adapt to the uh, phenology of the plant or the timing of that plant and the morphology of the plant as well. So a really great example of this in the upper right here is the double tooth prominent, which is a uh, caterpillar species that feeds exclusively on elm trees. And you can see that in its larval form as the caterpillar, it blends in really nicely to the double toothed uh, shape of that leaf as well. So this species has adapted to use this plant really effectively. Uh, but we see this kind of specialization across insect taxa from our hemipterans, our beetles, our flower flies, and even many of our bees, I believe about 30% of our Eastern uh, bees are pollen specialists as well. So we see specialism all over the place in the insect groups. Of course, these plant eating insects are the important prey species for a wide community of other invertebrate consumers like spiders and lady beetles and all kinds of stuff that are beneficial insects in their own right. Uh, but then when we get up a little higher, I am uh, originally an ornithologist, a bird ecologist. And so these plant eating insects are incredibly important to supporting bird communities as well. In fact, the majority of bird species require feeding on insects, at least in some point in the annual cycle. And if we look across the entire globe, many, many of our bird species are relying on mostly insects in their diet. So for our passerines, the songbirds, like our titmice and our cardinals, over 70% of our global songbirds are eating more than 50% of their diet are insects. But even within the insects, we know that birds just don't feed on everything indiscriminately. And we see again and again in, in uh, studies of choice that birds are preferen preferentially choosing lepidopterans, the butterflies and moths, 
especially when they're in their caterpillar form. And that's because I would argue that these caterpillars are really an avian superfood. Uh, they have really high protein, which is important for growing feathers and growing bones. They have really high calories, which makes them in a, a really effective and efficient uh, power packet of food. It's like getting a really big meal all at one time. They have uh, high carotenoids, which are important for immune function and for, um, for making those pretty reds that we see in cardinals and yellows and goldfinches. Uh, but caterpillars also have really high detection and predictability as well. And it's kind of the classic uh, system of phenological matching is the matching of birds when they raise their young to the peak of caterpillars throughout the year. And so it makes total sense that when we look at diets among bird species all across the United States, we see that many of these bird species are have a major component of their diet are caterpillars or they are preferred over other insect groups. And so in this way, our bird conservation is really intimately connected to insect conservation. And our insect conservation is built on the foundation of plant communities that we cultivate. And so those seemingly small decisions that we're making in our private parcels can cascade up to affect those whole food webs. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to speak to you and show you some evidence about uh, three systems where I've looked at these plant, insect, bird food webs and how these interactions can inform our habitat management. I'm gonna first talk to you about some of my dissertation work, looking at the impacts of non-native plants on urban food webs. Uh, next, I'm gonna to talk to you about some more recent work exploring patterns of uh, plant Lepidoptera interaction networks across the United States. Excuse me. And finally, I'm gonna end with um, a little bit of a teaser on some of my current research, looking at how host plant performance, um, specifically the dominance of oak trees, um, may predict resource selection and habitat quality for insectivorous birds. Uh, so first, uh, to talk about the impacts of non-native plants on urban food webs, which has been a major part of my research uh, for the last, uh, geez, almost 10 years now, <laughs> uh, and, and a topic that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and so just in brief, uh, before I started my PhD work, there were a lot of entomologists that had already looked at this question. And basically what they found was that native insects have co-evolved with native plants. And when we introduce non-native species through horticulture and agriculture and other sorts of plant selection, we are importing species that don't share this co-evolutionary relationship and then are not used by our native wildlife, um, at least not to the same extent of native species. So when we compare native plants to non-native plants, uh, on average, we find that the native species are supporting higher species diversity of insects. They're supporting higher abundance and biomass of those insects as well. And there is some of the most strongest relationships are found in our most highly specialized plant eating insects like our caterpillars. Um, and so entomologists had made the claim that if we see all these differences in, um, in the insect communities that are found on these native and non-native plants, that that would then have cascading impacts on the consumers that rely on them as food. Uh, but until I had started my PhD, this hadn't really been looked at in a mechanistic or explicit way. And so I had this really great opportunity to um, work with Doug Tallamy at University of Delaware and Pete Mara at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. And we asked this question about the linkages between non-native plants and insects and breeding birds in a community science project called Neighborhood Nest Watch. And it's this really great project, um, very unlike a lot of the community science out there because it's a very active relationship with our participate, participating householders. Uh, so in addition to allowing us on their property so that we can collect data, they also, uh, they also collect data themselves. They participate in our data collection. They get to see science in action. And they also get some wonderful opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one relationships with scientists so that they can ask questions about uh, 
the things that they see in their yard or some issue conservation issues that they're concerned about. So it's a really great opportunity to have this two way interaction uh, between uh, the householders that are managing these properties and then the scientists that want to understand how that management is then affecting biodiversity. Um, so it, it's just a wonderful project that I really had a, a great privilege to um, to work with in. And I wouldn't have been able to collect the scale of data that I did for this project without the help of all these amazing participants. And so within this project, we focused primarily on how yards were landscaped, whether with native or non-native uh, trees and shrubs, uh, the insects that were using those plants. And then we focused much of our work on uh, the breeding birds that were in those communities, especially the Carolina chickadee as a model insectivore. And so one of the first things that we found in this system, uh, which really just confirmed a lot of the research that was already out there, is that native trees tend to have higher prey biomass than the non-native trees in the same system. So we see on average, especially for caterpillars, that these native trees are supporting two to three times more abundant caterpillars and about five times the number of species compared to the non-native trees. Um, and we see that these uh, differences in community, in, in, in biomass of prey provided occurs all throughout the growing season, not just during the peak times of caterpillars, it occurs all throughout the entire breeding season. And we also see that these relationships occur for arthropods that aren't relying on the plant material itself, but maybe relying on these plant eating insects as prey. So we see very similar relationships in spiders with higher prey biomass on native trees compared to non-natives. And again, we see that relationship is consistent throughout the entire breeding season. So if the prey abundance is different, one of the questions that we want to ask is what is the, how is energy flowing for, through that system? Are the birds still feeding on these non-native plants or is there a disruption in the energy flow from the plant community to the consumer community? Um, it turns out that it's actually really difficult to study energy contributions of plants to other components of the food web at a community level simultaneously. And so we had to use um, a, a different kind of experimental technique to get at this question. And what we did was uh, use a stable isotope enrichment experiment with the collaboration of my friend Tomas Carlo at Penn State University. And he really helped us implement this experiment in residential yards in the Washington DC area where we applied a heavier isotope of nitrogen. So N15 is a uh, rare isotope that has one extra neutron. If we uh, enrich trees by spraying them with a foliar spray, the plants will then take up that nitrogen and then we can track the flow of nitrogen through the food web. And this technique has been used uh, to track nitrogen cycling across all kinds of different systems, but this is one of the only ones to use it to uh, track nitrogen contributions in an urban system, but also to track it to multiple levels of, uh, of mobile consumers as well. So tracking energy contributions from the plant food web up to the birds as well. Um, and so what we predicted basically was that in native trees, we would have nitrogen flow happening to the caterpillars that rely on those plants, to the spiders that rely on arthropod on insect prey, and then finally nitrogen enrichment in the birds that are relying on the insects as prey. Uh, alternatively, on the in the non-native plants, when we spray those plants and enrich them with this heavier nitrogen, we would actually see a dead end between the plant eating insects to the consumer insects where nitrogen flow is disrupted to the rest of the food web. At least that's what we predicted. And so what we found for the spiders is that uh, our predictions didn't play out. We actually saw that there was really no difference in the contributions of our enriched trees to the spider community. There were um, similar uh, contributions to diet from both native enriched trees and non-native enriched trees. So from the spider's perspective, where most of the impact is happening is just on the number of spiders that those trees are supporting, not in the actual diet that they're deriving from the trees that we found them on. <laughs> 
Where we did see some interesting differences was finally in our bird communities. And this is looking at eight different breeding bird species that use residential yards. And even though the contributions of diet from the few number of trees that we sprayed were really low, which makes sense because birds can go all over the place. They can feed, they, they have wide territories. Um, but what we did see is that the contributions of native trees were much higher to our birds uh, than the contributions of nitrogen from non-native trees, suggesting that these birds are feeding more often on native trees uh, compared to the non-natives, and that these non-natives are a potentially an energy dead end to the bird community. So if the birds are are uh, perceiving these birds, the, or if these non-native trees are not supporting the same amount of prey, and the birds are perceiving these trees as not uh, supporting the same amount of prey, or at least not acquiring prey from them, the next question is really, are there consequences to songbirds when non-native plants are abundant? If the bird doesn't have a choice and there's lots of non-native plants, are there any population level consequences? Um, and so when we looked at this question, the two real main points that I want to um, emphasize is number one, how we defined native and non-native species, which is an important thing to know in any kinds of these studies. So in this system, we considered non-native trees or rather native trees to be species that had a natural distribution that included the entire Eastern United States, which is a pretty broad distribution. The other thing to keep in mind is that we're not looking at species diversity or number of plants. We're really calculating tree and shrub foliage volume so that we can compare areas where the foliage biomass is predominantly native with areas where the foliage biomass is predominantly non-native. And so what we found is that as non-native plant biomass increases uh, in these uh, residential yard uh, habitats, the average number of young that are fledged per territory strongly declines in these Carolina uh, chickadees. Um, we actually found negative effects on both habitat use, such as uh, if the bird decided to even use that yard to breed in or whether they attracted a female and were able to initiate a nest. And we also found negative effects on habitat quality. So when they initiate a nest, how many eggs do they lay? How many young are successfully fledging? And it turns out that a lot of these effects are fairly modest when we look at them uh, in singular, but when we look at them all together throughout the full uh, breeding cycle of this bird, it adds up to be quite a, a dramatic reduction in the number of young that are fledged. Uh, we found no meaningful effects on uh, female adult survival of chickadees in these native and non-native yards. Um, and no meaningful effects in uh, post-fledging survival. So uh, what this is really suggesting is that when these birds are constrained to a central place to forage, like during the breeding season when they have a nest, that's when food limitation is most pronounced and the negative effects of non-native um, plants can be really seen. And once the birds are flexible in their behavior, in their diet, um, the negative effects of those non-native plants are um, either non-existent or much more subtle. And so if, they're, if we're seeing these, these major negative effects in reproduction, the next question is really, does that mean, is that meaningful at a population level? Because for a bird, if they're not fledging enough young, but they're surviving really well in these urban systems because of improved microclimates or reduced predators, um, that, that might mean that it doesn't really have a, a, a negative effect at the population level. And so what we did was take our data from uh, reproduction with the help of our community scientists who help us monitor nests. We also had um, 16 years of adult survival, again, with the help of our community scientists, uh, reciting color banded birds year after year to get at the probability of a female surviving to have another nest. And then finally, we used uh, track, um, sorry, uh, tagging radio telemetry tracking technology so that we could track our juveniles as well and see how well they're surviving in this gradient of non-native plants. And then we plugged all of that into a population model and, and ran a lot of uh, iterations so that we could see what the effect was. And so just to orient you to this graph, uh, here at zero is considered replacement. And so that means that chickadees have uh, produced enough young to support a growing population from year to year. 
Um, and so we would uh, expect that a growing population would be one that, have a, that would have a positive number and a uh, declining population would be one that has a negative number. And so what we found when we plugged all of our urban chickadee data in is that as non-native plant biomass increases, we have a strong negative effect on population growth uh, with birds only reaching re replacement at less than 10% uh, non-native plants. Um, but, you know, we were ecologists and we recognized when we ran these uh, that um, these models that we were plugging in three other models with varying levels of uncertainty to calculate this population growth. And so we wanted to be transparent about that. So when we made inferences about this, we didn't actually look at the main uh, or we didn't emphasize the main pattern of this relationship, but rather where that threshold lies. Um, so here where the confidence interval fails to overlap zero is at 30% non-native plants. And so what that means is that if these residential neighborhoods have less than 30% non-native plants, the birds have at least some chance of uh, producing enough young to sustain a local population. But once we get over that 30% non-native plants or less than 70% native plants, um, the probability of that happening is um, virtually non-existent. And so what's really powerful about this is that it provides a goal or a threshold that homeowners uh, can, can strive for if they're interested in improving their yard landscapes for insectivorous birds. But the other important thing is that it also provides a little bit of wiggle room for social values as well, because we all know that biodiversity conservation isn't the only thing that people are using when they're making their plant decisions. In fact, a lot of people have a lot of cultural um, and aesthetic attachments to certain plants. And so uh, what we encourage for folks is that there could be some room for those culturally valuable non-native plants if we uh, focus on increasing native plants in the rest of our ecosystems and really trying to hit that 70% native plant mark. Uh, of course, we only looked at Carolina chickadees. So if we want to think about more sensitive bird species, we're going to need more plants, more native cover. But it, this at least gives us something to start with. Um, and so, you know, with that paper, we got it published in a great journal. That was great. I was proud of that. But one of the things that I'm really proud of is how much that this work has been picked up and the enthusiasm that folks have displayed uh, to use this in their day-to-day -day action. Um, so it's just a couple of examples of how people have used the 70-30 thresholds is in justifying invasive plant removal um, by uh, North Carolina Audubon. Uh, Washington, D.C. has had several pitches to revamp their street tree planting to include uh, uh, native, more native species in the selection process. Uh, up here in Somerville, Massachusetts, we had uh, this town is the first um, municipality in the United States to successfully implant a native planting species ordinance, which is very exciting. Um, they actually went for 80%, but, you know, I'm not going to complain about that. Um, and what's really exciting about this particular ordinance is that um, it's kind of a catalyst for change. And so... The thing about people in Massachusetts is they don't want to be shown up. So now that Somerville has done it, now the rest of the towns are, are starting to say, OK, how can I how can I make the change in my town? How can I get involved and um, and be the squeaking wheel that that makes the change? So it's been really exciting to see how people have used this in their in their um, in their restoration work. So in a lot of this, I've been talking really about a dichotomy of native and non-native plants, um, but I wanna emphasize that uh, nativeness is really a gradient. So one of the questions th that we might ask is in terms of how native should we really aim um, if we're thinking about biodiversity conservation? Does it matter if it's a cherry tree that's right from our local ecosystem? Could it be a cherry tree from across the country? Or could it be a cherry tree from another country? These are sort of the questions that people are asking in their plant selection. And so we've we've compared these relationships among congeneric plants. So these are non-native cousins like Norway maple and Japanese cherry. And we see that in general, no, non-native congeners 
uh, that are from beyond the United States are not the ecological equivalent of native species. And we see in general that these non-native congeners are supporting 40% fewer caterpillars and about 50% fewer caterpillar species um, than their native cousins. Um, but uh, I want to talk about an undergrad project that I'm really excited about that's not published um, because I had this really great fortune to have Alphonsus Ho uh, work with me last year. And we got to talking about these native and, and non-native congeners and one thing that was really apparent is that a lot of these comparisons, which have been done uh, in lots of different studies, uh, have been mainly looking at diversity and abundance. And what hasn't really been looked at is individual fitness or performance of the caterpillars that are using these trees. Because we know if we go and sample a Japanese cherry tree, we actually find a lot of cherry specialist species that are using them. And so Alphonsus wanted to ask whether there were, there were negative consequences of non-native congeners as well as non-local congeners on the caterpillar performance of Promethea moths. And so he raised this charismatic silk moth on 18 different species of cherry trees that he found throughout the campus. Um, and really what he found is that among all of these cherry trees that he looked at, there was a lot of variation in performance. And overwhelmingly, his caterpillars did the best on black cherry, which is Prunus serotina. Um, they did uh, a little worse on other native prunuses like uh, fire cherry, as well as non-local cherries like um, uh, beach plum and sand cherry. Um, and they did the worst on the non-native congeneric species. So these are ones that are imported through horticulture from other countries beyond the United States. But they didn't do as bad as the plants that aren't appropriate hosts for this species. So in some congeneric cherries, these caterpillars did survive, um, which was encouraging. Um, but what wasn't encouraging was how they grew. And uh, one of my favorite things in ecology is when you have results where you don't have to show a graph, all you have to show is a picture. And so this is a picture of the growth of um, caterpillars on two species of cherry after 40 days. And you can see on the left, the uh, caterpillar that was grown on black cherry had reached its final instar and was ready to pupate and to um, grow into an adult moth. But at the same 40 days on um, a different species of Korean cherry, that caterpillar was still only in its second instar. And in fact, even though it tried to get to its la latest instar, it eventually died during one of its molts. Um, so in this case, the uh, congeneric species are affecting not just diversity and abundance, but performance as well. Uh, so that's all I'm talking about for non-native plants, but just to recap, some of the things that we found is that there are negative effects on arthropod diversity, abundance, as well as biomass, which is most relevant for our consumer arthropods and birds. We found reduced trophic con um, contributions to insectivores, especially our, our breeding bird community, and declines in population growth in our Carolina chickadees. And finally, we found that our congeneric non-native trees are not the ecological equivalent of the native species that they're replacing. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to speak about the uh, patterns of plant uh, caterpillar interactions across the United States. Uh, and if any of you here are entomologists, you um, may already uh, come to mind that even if we look at native species, they vary a lot in insect diversity that they're supporting. So it's not as if all native species are just wonderful and support tons and tons of diversity. Um, and we had recognized this as well, but we were really curious about how variable those relationships are between plants and especially the caterpillars that rely on these plants for food. And so what we did was undergo a, a big data synthesis literature search for plant caterpillar interactions across the United States. Um, and in the end, we came up with a data set of more than 24,000 interactions from over um, uh, 
3,600 publications representing over 2,000 woody and herbaceous plant genera so that we could really quantify what are the number of caterpillar species that different plant genera support. And we did this at the genus level because when we look at the historical literature, in many cases, the actual plant species wasn't recorded or there's some bias in what plants were actually studied. So at least at this uh, at this state in our data synthesis, we can make our best inference at the general level. Um, and so I apologize that I don't have Missouri in my uh, data set on this computer. So I have to give you your neighboring Illinois. So this is an example of, of the variation that you might see among native trees. So in Illinois, they have 2,292 different uh, butterflies and moths. And of those uh, species, 461 of them can be found on oak trees, 355 on cherries, 308 on willows. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have lots of native trees that don't support very much uh, caterpillar diversity at all. So we have things like holly at 44, tulip tree at 20, our pawpaw trees at 12, and many herbaceous plants and vines that aren't known to support any species at all, at least to our knowledge at this at this moment. Um, you know, I want to emphasize, you know, for pawpaw, there are uh, four species of moths and butterflies that specifically rely on pawpaw. So if you want to support those species, you definitely need to include that plant. So this is not to say that that's not an important species to have. But for the rest of those 12 species are generalist uh, caterpillars that can use lots of different plants. So at least when we think about things at a community or a meta community level, it's not serving uh, quite the same ecological function. And so when we uh, look at distribution parameters across the United States of uh, the number of caterpillar species that are found on, on each plant, we see uh, a very skewed distribution with most of the plants supporting very few caterpillars at all, and just a small handful of plant genera that are supporting the majority of the caterpillars. In fact, across the United States, we found that 14% of the plants are supporting more than 90% of the butterflies and the moths. And we see that the slope of these relationships, so the number of plants that are doing the lion's share of supporting that diversity are really unaffected by other uh, ecosystem parameters such as uh, climate, latitude, ecosystem, number of available plant species, all of those ecological parameters really didn't affect the degree of that skew. But what we found is that when we were looking at things on a county by county or a state by state basis, there were a lot of plants that kept coming up again and again as being disproportionately important. And so I had, I had read a paper at that same time um, where uh, Harvey uh, from University of Montreal, I believe, had used network methods in order to identify keystone species within a food web. And so I uh, that, that paper inspired some ideas with me. And so I modified some of his, um, his models to only look at the basal plant layer so that we could uh, use these different network metrics to evaluate contributions of plants to this binary food web. Uh, or binary network. And so when we look at network richness, network sensitivity, or the number of specialist species, network stability, uh, we, calc we took all of those metrics as being equally important and calculated scores for each one of these plants in each one of these locations, and then looked at the average score that a plant was contributing to food webs. And what we found is that there were about 12 uh, plant genera that were considered outliers relative to all the rest of the plants that, were, um, that we evaluated. And that there were some, and when we saw these outliers as, as contributing disproportionately to the rest of the food web, we considered them keystone species at this continental level as supporting um, disproportionately more to the plant lepidoptera food web. And so that prioritizing these species might then be a really, uh, a potentially effective uh, method for contributing to conservation of lepidoptera, especially in these cultivated planted systems.
Um, as much as I would like to go out and just plant a lot of these keystone species and then look at the responses, that would take a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of labor. So we relied on simulation methods so that we could uh, we could simulate uh, selection of naive planting or informed planting using keystone species so that we could see how does that contribute to species diversity of caterpillars as well as interaction diversity of uh, caterpillars as well, uh, looking at both woody and herbaceous plants. And what we found is that for both woody plants and even more so in our herbaceous plants, is that by intentionally including these keystone plants in our selection, not as the whole community, but just a subset of that plant community, we can support uh, three or more times more interaction and species compared to these naive plantings. Um, so from an efficient perspe perspective or um, an, an effectiveness perspective, it's more effective to have this kind of informed planting that prioritizes interaction or contributions to interaction networks. Of course, all of this has been based on uh, literature records, not actual data that was collected in the field. And so we needed to evaluate that what we see when we actually go out in the field would, would be represented by these scores as well. And so we used data that we had collected in some hedgerows in Pennsylvania and compared that to the Pennsylvania literature scores. And we saw a really, really tight relationship between those two calculated metrics. Um, so uh, a 0.83 correlation, almost a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, but this is mainly driven by most of the plants that we evaluated were had really low scores and weren't doing very much at all. And most of this relationship is driven by two data points, which are the cherries and uh, which is black cherry and white oak, which would both be considered keystone species in our analysis. And they actually overperformed relative to what the literature scores would predict. Um, and we also saw that there were some plants that uh, underperformed relative to what our scores would predict like sassafras and uh, red maple. And so, um, so that really just goes to show that number one, that our literature scores can be helpful in the absence of collecting real on the ground field data, um, but also that there's variation and nuance that uh, we can't explain, uh, but will have to be accounted for as well. Um, so it leaves a lot of new questions opened as well. Uh, so in terms of um, this particular project, looking at these patterns of plant caterpillar interactions across the US, we found that these interaction networks are consistently skewed no matter where you are in the United States, whether you're in Missouri or Massachusetts, there's very few plants that are supporting the majority of your butterflies and moths. We found that some plant genera are disproportionately important for supporting uh, most of these and that um, using our restoration simulations that inform selection can potentially uh, improve our restoration efforts by prioritizing these keystone genera. But like I said, this raises a lot of questions. So this is where a lot of my research is going now, especially to think about oak trees, which across all of the United States is supporting 20% of the butterflies and the moths, which was way more than any other plant genera that we looked at. And so potentially oak trees are a really important keystone species uh, for these insect interactions. And so my work now is really to understand what are the intrinsic, so how do different oak trees vary, and the ext extrinsic factors such as environment, latitude, elevation, how are these uh, contributing to the ability of specific plants at a species level to support arthropod diversity? So. Uh, hopefully you'll see some work on that in the near future. And then the project that I'm working on now is to really think about if these oak trees are really important for supporting insect diversity and biomass, does this have some meaningful impact for habitat quality for insect eating birds? And um, 
This is uh, a project that is ongoing, so I don't have a lot to present to you today, but I'll just give you a little bit of a teaser. But a lot of this is couched in the increasing interest of uh, urban foresters and arborists to think about how silviculture techniques can be used in urban systems. And so there's um, a lot of interest to switch from just leaving these urban forest fragments alone and just letting them do their thing to thinking about how they can be used for timber or for supporting conservation as well as supporting people and how we can use forest management to achieve all these goals. So uh, my questions are really about if we can manage forest communities to support birds by prioritizing oak trees. And I have a little bit of evidence from my previous systems that this is probably the case. So when we looked at our Carolina chickadees to see what trees that they preferred to forage on, we found that the number of caterpillar species that a plant supports was strongly predicted uh, how much that bird preferred to forage in that tree relative to others that were available to it. Um, so we see this really nice linear relationship only in the native trees where the species like oaks that are supporting hundreds and hundreds of caterpillar species are almost always the most preferred one for foraging. Another place where we found um, a lot of evidence for oaks being really important for bird foraging is in an undergrad project that uh, Garrison Peel did uh, at University of Delaware. And he used these clay caterpillar models to look at the survival of these fake caterpillars on different tree species throughout the year. And what he found was that it didn't matter if it was spring or summer or fall, that caterpillars were always experiencing the highest predation in the trees that support the most diversity of caterpillars and probably in turn the most abundance in biomass as well, suggesting that the caterpillars and other insects that we observe on these trees when we do our field sampling are actually just the residue of predation that's already really a lot higher than any other plant that's out there. Um, and we see that there is some effect of seasons. So predation was lower in the fall when birds are switching to fruit, and that makes sense. Um, but across the board, our oak trees had really high predation of caterpillars uh, during spring migration, when birds are moving through on their, on their journeys north, and especially during the breeding season when birds are feeding their young. And so a lot of this work has, has really uh, informed these questions that I have about how forest management and urban forest management can be used for migratory bird conservation, because this is an area of research that's been really underexplored in the literature. Uh, migratory birds are moving these vast distances in order to uh, travel from the rainforests of Central and South America up to the boreal forests of Canada. And along the way, they have to stop in a lot of novel ecosystems and land uses while they make these journeys. And so a lot of species of conservation concern, like black pole warbler and golden winged warbler, um, don't necessarily breed in urban areas, but they use them extensively in order to find food during arguably the hardest part of the annual cycle. <laughs> And so when we were studying urban forests and yards, we found that more than 50 species of migratory birds were using Washington DC during their migration. And again, many of these species of uh, conservation concern. And so my research now is really to kind of open the door on these migratory species and see if this forest management uh, for oak species might actually benefit their ability to refuel in these forests? Or are these birds flexible enough to deal with this kind of uncertainty uh, and variation in prey availability and still migrate successfully? So um, this is in collaboration with the Forest Service, uh, with Susanna Lerman and with Alex Gerson, who's a physiologist here at UMass Amherst. And we're looking at forest fragments along a gradient of both urbanization and oak dominance. And one of the main things that we're doing in these systems is to sample the tree communities, we're sampling the insect communities for prey, but most importantly, we're actually capturing these birds in these systems and collecting blood and fecal samples so that we can evaluate 
their ability to refuel using plasma metabolites and their diet using a combination of both stable isotopes to look at carbon and nitrogen as an indicator of trophic position and uh, looking at the actual species that they're feeding on using uh, diet um, uh, fecal metabarcoding as well. And so this is ongoing work. I don't have a lot of results, but there's a lot of um, really encouraging things that are coming out of it. So I'll share a, a few of, um, of what we found so far. Uh, so we, we get a lot of different migratory species in these forests, but there's just a handful that we get good samples on. And they really are separated into species that are very, very omnivorous um, and, and forage on a lot of fruit, uh, like the red-eyed vireo or the Swainson's thrush or the hermit thrush. Um, and contrast that with a lot of species that are um, nearly or obligately insectivorous, um, or at least functionally so. Uh, they forage a lot in the foliage of the trees rather than on the ground, um, and they're potentially uh, less flexible in their diet. So across these species that we were able to get good samples on, we have these species, um, especially in the fall, that are known to use uh, fruit during to switch to a fruit-based diet in the fall, and that we did observe them eating fruits in our system through uh, their fecal samples, um, not the barcoding yet, but at least superficially. And then we have another uh, cohort of species that um, are less likely to consume fruit, and we have no observations of any of their samples really containing fruit. And so what we found so far when we look at um, indicators of condition, such as how big that bird is relative to its size, as well as refueling in terms of the triglycerides that we measure in our assays, we see that there are, com there are some general trends, but there's some community level differences as well. So uh, here, this is um, a uh, distribution of our uh, predicted parameters. So up here on the top is our fruit eating species, and we find that there's a lot of variation in them in their responses to uh, whether a forest is urban or non-urban. Uh, but they also tend to be uh, to have actually lower condition and lower refueling rates in our systems that have high oak dominance, which probably is because high oak dominance is also strongly correlated with other changes in the plant community, such as shrub uh, and fruit um, producing species. Uh, alternatively, when we look at our insectivorous guilds, so these are things like perulas and black pole, black pole warblers and other foliage gleaning uh, insectivorous species, we see relationships, which is what we would predict, is that these species tend to have uh, lower condition and poor refueling rates in these urban landscapes, in these urban forest fragments. But if these systems have a high oak dominance, regardless if, if they're urban or rural, the, uh, these insect foliage gleaning birds are in a higher condition. At least at a guild level, there seems to be some patterns in these relationships. But one of the important things about this type of, of of analysis that I'm doing is that uh, we can look at things at a community perspective, but we can also look at things at a species level perspective. And that's a really powerful thing about these sort of mixed level modeling is that we can also derive what the uh, effects are at a species level. And that's where we see a lot of nuance. So in our fruit eating species, we have, even though most of them are doing better in urban systems, uh, we have some species that do really poorly like the red-eyed vireo that eats fruit, but also tends to forage a lot in the canopy. Um, and though, even though our, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, they tend to be, they tend to have poor condition and refueling in these high oak systems. Um, and black pole warblers, which are doing better in these high oak systems, which is consistent with um, the rest of the community. But then on the flip side, we have some species that are exhibiting, um, at least some evidence that they have the opposite relationship. So for Swainson's thrush, even though that they're eating a lot of fruit or at least uh, uh, assumed to be eating a lot of fruit during migration, we actually see that they have higher performance when there's more oaks. 
And on the flip side, we have black and white warblers that have poor performance when they're oaks. So there's a community level response, but there's also these individual level responses that may contradict what we uh, see uh, in at the community level because we're not taking into consideration actually what those individuals are eating, which is the next piece of data uh, that I'm waiting on <laughs> to get the lab work so that we can make those direct inferences between the diet and the type of insects that these birds are feeding on um, and their refueling and condition. Um, in the, the other difference is in terms of phenology. So those were the results in the fall where we see the most pronounced differences. In the spring, the uh, differences are still apparent in our ground foraging species. Uh, so now we don't have any fruit, but they can forage on the ground and they're very flexible in that regard. Uh, but we have uh, almost no relationship in our foliage gleaning species, suggesting that there's potentially some behavioral flexibility that's happening for this guild, either in terms of the insects that they're choosing or how they forage or how long they're staying or other aspects of the environment that's different between spring and fall. Uh, so that's where that research is right now. There's a lot more to do, um, and we will hopefully have some really interesting uh, patterns to share in the near future when we start connecting the insect biomass to the phenology of these species in these different forests, their diet and their condition, and then finally using advanced tracking technology so that we can quantify exactly how long that they're staying in these, in these areas. So stay tuned. Um, so with that, um, you know, th this, this work is ongoing, but uh, in general, we have some evidence that birds are preferentially foraging in caterpillar rich trees. We also have some evidence, at least on this project so far, that in insectivorous migratory birds are experiencing some higher quality habitat in oak dominated forests, although these more flexible omnivorous species might not have those same relationships. And so, yeah, I encourage you to stay tuned for uh, new work in the future. Um, so with that, I appreciate you taking all the time. I know I went a little bit over, but there's so much exciting to talk about. Um, if you want to access any of my papers, uh, please visit my website or feel free to email me or find me on Twitter. And I'll take any questions if there's time for that. Thank you so much. Can you see us and hear us? I can't hear you. <laughs> well, I hear you, but. Okay. okay. If you have questions, yeah. you might have to come to the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone in here have questions? Or I should say, who in here has questions? <laughs> Um, hi. <laughs> so when you were talking about caterpillars and um, oak as a keystone species, I was thinking about the size of the trees and oaks are pretty tall canopy hardwoods. So I was wondering if there's any correlation between what is a keystone species for caterpillars and also the size of the tree and how you might think that that plays into what urban foresters choose to incorporate in their their cities mm -hmm. sure yeah that's a that's a multifaceted question so the first part that you're getting at in terms of the biomass of oaks in the system so that that's part of where our research is going so what there's a lot of um mutually non-exclusive hypotheses for why some plant genera or some plant species might support more diversity of arthropods than others. So one of those is a dominance hypothesis. So it, it could be that there's just more available biomass or more available um, uh, dist or wider distributions of these plants. Uh, so there's more potential for insects to um, evolve adaptations to them. Um, another hypothesis could be evolutionary. So we could think about hypotheses related to uh, um, uh, phylogenetic history or age or relatedness to other um, 
uh, other components of the plant community. Uh, there's also functional hypotheses in terms of foliar nitrogen, water content. Um, you know, there, there's lots of different things that we could think about. And that is exactly where our research is going, because that's the big question that came up is like, OK, that's great. You found these patterns. But why? <laughs> And why do we see variation at a branch level? Um, what, what's contributing to that sort of variation? So those are some of the questions that we really are trying um, to uncover. I would suspect that uh, biomass of the plant in the ecosystem has at least, I, I, I would say, I, I would predict that it has the substantial um, contribution to variation. Because even if we just look at herbaceous plants, a lot of the ones that support most of the caterpillar diversity are ones that have wide distributions or lots of species or things like that. Um, and, you know, in oaks in Europe, it's the same thing. So, it you know, so it, there are global patterns as well. Um, but that that's something that we, we need bigger data sets and um, higher quality data synthesis to get at. And so that's where my research is going now. So if you want to help, <laughs> reach out. Um, the other question has to do with like what foresters might um, might uh, prioritize. So the foresters like oak trees. They're durable. They're beautiful. They um, some species can be really tolerant to urban conditions. Um, they uh, can provide timber. Uh, that some cities like Baltimore are starting to implement. They have an urban wood project um, where communities are getting uh, uh, are, are are starting new economies based on urban wood, which is very exciting. So, um, but there's lots of things that foresters are choosing when they're selecting trees, and so the real key is getting the information to the folks that can actually implement it, so that they're not planting uh, Bradford pears and Norway maples because people think they're pretty when in reality, they're actually not very resilient at all and don't ver support very much diversity either. So um, there's a lot of different choices that come into selection. So we gotta be loud. So biodiversity can be a part of that. Um, I was wondering, um, as you've been working with community members and communicating to them like the different species that they should be planting to help with biodiversity in their like um, yards and in their surrounding communities, mm -hmm. what like resistances have you encountered from people? Like what reasons have you maybe ever seen from people for why they might not want to plant these native species that are so important? Like, I don't know, maybe some seeds of some trees people find annoying or like what reasons have they not wanted to? Yeah, so um, for the most part, um, a lot of people have been really open to this information, um, especially when we think about charismatic taxa, like, like pollinators and songbirds. Those are really um, wonderful kind of representative species for food webs. And people are like, if they're not on board with caterpillars, they're on board with birds. And they love the idea like when I when I give talks, I say, oh, you know, the best bird feeder that you can do is to plant one and look at all these amazing species that you can attract. And people love that. They're they're very excited about it. The biggest pushback that I see is I guess two things. One is that, um, you know, personal observation is really powerful. So I have data, but people didn't observe that. Um, and they might have something like a butterfly bush in their yard that attracts a lot of butterflies. And so they're they're like, well, you know, that's all well and good, but like I have a non-native species and it's really good. And so, you know, what I what I do in those cases is really encourage people to just try it, just plant something and then and then take the time to, you know, learn what comes to it. Use iNaturalists and um you know, there's a reason they say that milkweed is like the gateway drug to insect conservation. And that's because it's really obvious when you plant a milkweed, you get monarch butterflies in many cases. And that is a very powerful thing because then people feel like, oh, my God, I did something. It worked. And so um, so, so I just encourage people to try. You know, you don't have to plant an oak tree or revamp your whole yard. Just try. Just plant a, a joe pie weed or a goldenrod and see what comes to it. Um, the other major pushback that I get is not really pushback, but 
feeling like it's not that there's too many barriers. So, and, and I acknowledge that. So there are major barriers to restoring your yard or planting native plants in terms of availability, uh, accessibility, costs, how much time does it take? Like all of these things are hard. And, um, and so, you know, I don't have the right answer to how to, how to deal with, like with that. But when I talk to people, I try to meet them where they are, like, especially talking about gradients of native plants, like, okay, now I'm not saying you have to go out and plant your local genotype because they're really expensive and hard to find, but maybe, you know, where, where can we start to make change? Where can we see things? Um, and, you know, and accessibility, like, you know, if, if you want to plant native plants and you go to Home Depot and they don't have any, make a stink about it because it's not going to be me that convinces Home Depot. It's going to be you um, and a lots of people complaining. Um, so that's the major pushback is that it's at right now it's not accessible. Um, and that's where we need to. I, I don't think it's a. An in, a lack of information, I think when people are armed with the information they'll make decisions that are good for them and good for wildlife. Um, but uh, in many cases, the, it, it's not it's not easy to do that. Um, we don't have incentives to do that. Uh, I put a question from YouTube in the chat for you. Uh, Okay, this says, um, thank you for the great talk. I was curious if you think the 30% threshold for non-native plants might translate to native invaders like pawpaw. Uh, and then the second part of this question says, I was also wondering if you think certain functional traits are correlated with the extent of a non-native tree's negative consequences to insect and bird populations. Um, yes. and. Yes. <laughs> so for the first part of the question, um, it's important to think about the difference between um, a cultivated novel urban system and, and an invaded system. So uh, in, in, in the residential yards that we were working in, it, it was actually hyper diverse um, because people were prioritizing lots and lots of different plants and every neighborhood had different plants and every yard has different plants. So it's extremely diverse. But most of the plants that are being planted um, are functionally pauperate. So it's kind of a different relationship with something like an invasive plant that is not just doesn't share a coevolutionary history, but also homogenizes the plant community, which has other, you know, other negative effects in its own right, regardless of its origin. Um, in something like a native invader, like pawpaw, or another case is, um, I believe it's called um, the Mexican honey locust. Um, you know, they are invasive. I, I would call them aggressive and extending their natural distributions. Yeah, there's different situations. Sometimes it's human facilitated. Sometimes it's climate facilitated. But in in either case the um the distribution is changing in a shorter extent so that there's potentially related or similar native insect species that could use them um or birds that can adapt you know so so in the few studies that i've seen to look at this the the negative effects are less pronounced um but there's always plant nuance so like paul paul doesn't support a lot of caterpillar species. So if it's replacing um, a viburnum dominated community, you're gonna have a really drastic change in the insect community just because of that nuance. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it's invasive um, or aggressive. Um, so in those cases, it can be very context dependent. Um, but in the case of, sorry, I'm like really chatty about this. So in the case of human facilitated movement, we can also think about things like assisted migration. And that's something that we, it's a very high concern in New England because we're planting southerly species at the wazoo in preparation for 2100. Um, and no one to my knowledge has looked at whether what that means or what, what native insects are using them. And I would, I would predict that it filters for generalist species, but we're hoping to get money so that we can look at that specifically. 
Um, and in terms of functional traits correlating with the extent of non-native trees, negative consequences, yes, um, you know, on one hand, um, congeneric non-natives are very popular because they have reduced pests. So um, if it's closely related to our native species, it's going to have more than something that's completely unrelated, like a ginkgo um, or a golden rain tree or something. Um, but on the other extent, uh, there's, there's correlation between what is successful in horticulture and what is successful um, uh, or, or the negative consequences for biodiversity. So um, in horticulture, they prioritize things that are pretty and things that are easy to take care of. Those often um, uh, unintentionally also reduce biodiversity. So the human filtering aspect of it has already selected for plants that probably support less biodiversity overall. I think that might get at what you're getting at. And there's lots of functional, we could make a whole list of functional traits that would contribute to low pest problems, but they probably all are relevant sometimes. Well, Desiree, thank you so much. Uh, everyone give another round of applause. Thank you. And that's it. We uh, hope to have you out at Tyson sometime. Yeah, thanks for everything and the invitation and um, 